Well, welcome <coughs> to uh, Salford Community Church uh, this morning, especially uh, those of you uh, who are listening online. And we pray the Lord bless, will bless us as we seek to worship our Saviour together. Let's, uh, let's just open in prayer. Let's, uh, let's pray. Once more, Father, we praise you and thank you that we can come and gather around your word. And we pray, Father, that especially we might know the help of God, the Holy Spirit, uh, that he might come and aid us, Lord, in the reading of your word and in prayer and in the preaching of your word too, because we want to be a people, Lord, who will hear your voice and we pray, Father, that you will uh, speak to us and that we might be receptive. We pray that you'd open our mind, ears, eyes, our hearts to receive from you. Uh, and then, Father, we simply just don't want to hear from you. We want to be those who will put into practice what you're telling us so that we might find ourselves to be faithful servants of the living Lord Jesus Christ. So bless us then, we pray at this time, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, we're, we're returning again to Mark chapter 4, and we're going to take a reading from verse uh, 26, uh, right to the end of the chapter. And uh, let's share God's word. And he said, the kingdom of God is it, as is if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Then he said, To, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed which when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds on earth. But when it is sown, it grows up. Uh, but when it is sown, it, is gro it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But... Without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, may the Lord add his blessing to that reading from his precious word this morning. Well, I want to uh, give a a short word, especially to the younger members of the church uh, this morning. And uh, we've got a title up here, Waiting for Help. Now, I want to tell you uh, about uh, uh, something that happened uh, in the life of a man called George Muller. Now, I'm sure quite a lot of people know who George Muller was. Um, he uh, was a remarkable Christian who lived in Bristol almost uh, 200 years ago now, and uh, he came from Germany. That's why his name is Muller. Uh, he trained to be a pastor, and for a while he was a pastor in a church in Bristol. So that's uh, quite 
close to us, isn't it, really? But it was while he was a pastor in Bristol, he, uh, and he walked the streets, said his life was changed. He was changed because he saw the young children, lots of young children, who uh, didn't have anywhere to live, were sleeping rough on the streets and begging on the streets of Bristol. And uh, the Lord laid it on his heart uh, to begin uh, to, to have an orphanage. Uh, in fact, uh, I think, I'm not sure how many orphan homes there were that he established in Bristol, but there was quite a few. There was at least three, maybe more than that. Uh, and he was famous for his orphanage, for, for gathering the young people, uh, young children off the streets of Bristol and uh, enabling them to, to have a, a good life, a better life in the orphanages that he had made. And it was all done by prayer. But something else that he's famous for was the fact that he was considered to be a great man of prayer. And uh, he never asked anyone for any money in order to purchase the homes or to provide the food uh, for the orphans or for the clothing and all the other things that he needed to run the orphanages. But what he used to do was that every year, I think it was at the end of the, uh, of the year, so it would be about the end of December, January, he would publish the kind of accounts and some of the stories that took place concerning the orphanages. And every year, uh, there was always sufficient funds for the orphanages uh, to continue. Uh, the, 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 need, the needs were met. And, uh, and uh, he never asked anybody for anything. Instead, he and those who were working with him uh, gathered together to pray about the needs of the orphanages, the needs of the orphans, and what was needful. Now, I want to tell you about one of those stories uh, f from this, and it's November 21st, and it's 1838. Now, that's a long, long time ago, isn't it? 21st of November, 1838. Uh, and this man, uh, George Muller, had gone up to the orphanages, the orphan homes, as he normally did, and uh, uh, saw what was going on, and uh, he writes on this particular occasion because he had a diary, and he wrote in this diary uh, that there was absolutely no funds left. Not even a half penny, he said. Uh, not many of us would know what a half penny was, but there was not even a half penny for the food that was needed for the following day. But the people managed to have a, a, what he described as a good meal, with a, with a quantity of bread that they were able to, to fill their stomachs with. And so people were satisfied. But he gathered the, what he called the matrons of the houses. Now, I suppose they were the sort of people who were looking after the house. And he gathered them together, and together they, they prayed uh, about tomorrow, about the next day, and where, and where the money would come from, and where the food might come from and all the other things that they needed because they didn't have anything at all. So he prayed and he writes in his diary that at one o'clock in the afternoon, having had this time of prayer, prayer with the matrons, he decided he was going to walk home. But he writes in his diary, he says, uh, feeling very old, he decided to go for a much longer walk. Uh, I suppose he decided he... He needed to have some exercise. So instead of going to his, his normal route home, he went on a, a much longer route in order to get a bit of exercise. And uh, when he got home, there was a man. Uh, well, a, a man met him about, he says, about 20 yards from his house. And uh, this man, having walked him to his house, this man gave him 10 pounds. Now, 10 pounds in 1838 was a lot of money. And the man had said that he'd been there two or three times that day to give him this 10 pounds, uh, and he was going to give up, and he was not going to bother. And he was just walking away from the house when he saw George Muller coming. And George Muller's comment is that God is a God of providence, because if he had arrived a couple of minutes later, uh, he wouldn't have had, they wouldn't have had the 10 pound. But now they had the 10 pound, in order to pay for the food and other things for the orphans. And he made the comment that God had never let him down 
in any way. Well, I'm going to ask a question now. Do you, do you worry? Do you worry over things? Do you worry, perhaps, that uh, certain things that, that you want to happen, uh, that you believe should happen, are not going to happen? Do you, do you worry about the fact that God really loves you? Well, God has promised, and this is, this is the testimony of this man, George Muller, God has promised in his Bible that he will listen to the prayers and answer the prayers of all those who love him, all those who love Jesus. And George Muller proved that in his life. And he, as a result, he's become very, a very famous Christian. You can read his biography. You can read his diaries if you want to as well. Uh, but uh, that's, that's what it says, the Bible. But God promises that uh, he will listen to all our prayers if we truly love the Lord Jesus. Now, if it wasn't for COVID uh, this morning uh, and that uh, pandemic, uh, I would have uh, got us to sing a hymn. But I'm going to read the verse of the hymn to you. It says this. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And that was true of George Muller. <laughs> when he had a problem, big problem, like he couldn't feed the orphans in the orphan homes, well, he brought it to the Lord in prayer. And the Lord answered him in, in a wonderful way. Well, we're going to come before the Lord now in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you that uh, in Christ and because of Christ, we can come to prayer and that Lord as we've heard already uh, this morning when we pray and and when we love the Lord Jesus Christ and we do pray in the name of Jesus then you hear our prayers and you have promised to answer our prayers and sometimes Lord we must confess that the answers that we get from you may be a no and that's uh, that's right because it would be perhaps best for us if the answer was no. And sometimes it's a wait and uh, a wait and, and see. A wait for help, as was the case for George Muller. And sometimes, Lord, it's a, it's a definite yes. And we praise you. I want to praise you and thank you, Lord, for all the positives as well as and the negatives of prayer. And thank you, Lord, that you are the sovereign God. You are, you're in charge of all things. You know where all things uh, are going. You're the, the God who was there in the beginning and the God who's there, there at the end. And Lord, you're working your plan and your purposes out even this very day in which we live. And so, Father, we ask and pray again, uh, especially for those in the fellowship who are not able to be here this morning. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'd help them if they're not feeling well. We pray that you'd help them, Lord, if it's because of the, the weather at the moment, but whatever the situation, uh, we pray that you would bless them, and we pray you would bless them also, Lord, if they're able to listen there at home uh, and uh, listening to what's taking place today. Father, we give you praise and thanks uh, for the fact that you have your people in the world today, and we pray especially for those of your people who are in difficult situations. We think of those, Lord, perhaps, who are living in countries where the, the, the country itself doesn't really like Christians, doesn't really want to believe in the Lord Jesus, but that they're trying to be faithful, and as a result of their faithfulness, they suffer. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with them and help them uh, and give them the uh, wisdom and discernment, Lord, to be able to, to do uh, that work of going and telling and sharing the gospel with others. We think also, Lord, of those people who are involved in uh, Christian ministry, Lord, uh, perhaps like George Muller, again, uh, seeking to help uh, the poor and the needy and, and the downtrodden. Uh, we think especially, Lord, of uh, your people who are working in these um, 
migrant camps uh, that are uh, sadly around the world. And pray, Father, that they may be able, as they seek to serve, to share the gospel with others also. We think, Lord, also of your, your, your people who are in times of, of great blessing, uh, where they know that as the gospel is preached, many hundreds, if not thousands of people come to faith in Christ as they hear the good news of the Lord Jesus. And Lord, we, we thank you that you are building your church and the gates of hell uh, are not going to prevail against it. And uh, uh, Father, we uh, also pray for our own nation at this time. Uh, Lord, we're in a very difficult situation. Uh, Lord, we have this, uh, this problem, like so many other countries, Lord, of the, of the pandemic with us, and many people, Lord, being feeling of, uh, isolated and alone. Lord, we uh, pray, perhaps in those situations of loneliness, they may remember the gospel, remember uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and know uh, the moving of your spirit in their souls, that they, may, they know that they may have a friend in Jesus when they believe in him. And Lord, we pray for uh, the leaders of our land as well, and pray that uh, in their decision-making, they will have great wisdom, and that, Lord, you would guide them. But as we think of the pandemic, Lord, we also think of another disease in our land, and that's uh, the disease of uh, uh, spiritual poverty, where, uh, Lord, people are disregarding your word, uh, ignoring the Lord Jesus Christ as the one true Savior, have no thought or consider consideration concerning their own, even their own souls. Even when, Lord, we hear so often on the news now uh, the number of people that are ill because of uh, COVID-19 and sadly the number of people who have died. Uh, Lord, in these circumstances, we pray that God the Holy Spirit may be working in the, in the people of our land, uh, stirring up, Lord, thoughts of perhaps their own frailty, their own mortality, and that they may be looking for uh, eternal life in and through Jesus himself. We pray your blessing upon the churches. We thank you, Lord, as a church, we're able uh, to uh, be open this morning and plan, Lord, to open uh, next Sunday morning and evening. And uh, Lord, we ask your blessing upon that. But we're also mindful of other churches and thank you for them. Those churches, Lord, that are open, those churches, Lord, that are broadcasting on the internet too, even as we are, uh, and pray and ask, Lord our God, that in these things you will take of your word, your gospel, and Lord, it would, it would speak into the hearts of many, many people. Uh, perhaps some, Lord, who would not really want to be in a church uh, or, or to be gathered with a congregation. But Lord, we pray nonetheless for your Spirit's work. You might indeed sow that precious gospel seed and that there will come uh, that harvest of souls, we ask. We pray all this then in the precious name of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's, um, let's turn to the scriptures, and uh, we're going to be thinking about gospel seeds scattered on the ground uh, this morning. And uh, for that, we're... We're going to be uh, looking at uh, Mark chapter 4 and verses 26 to 29. And uh, that's the, the parable there of the man who scattered seed on the ground. Let me read it to you once more, uh, just to remind ourselves. The kingdom of God is, is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. This uh, parable, in, uh, strangely enough, I, I thought it was quite strange, uh, is the only, t only t place where it's found in the Gospels, in the four Gospels. Uh, Mark 
and uh, verses 26 to 29 is the only place where this particular parable is found. But the Lord Jesus Christ spoke uh, with an, uh, a number of parables that begin with a reference to the kingdom of God, just like this one. The kingdom of God is as, and there's a number of parables that start in, in that way. But what I want to say right at the very beginning for us is this. Um, the kingdom of God parables are, are not speaking of heaven, but rather of the kingdom of God on earth. The work, as in this case, the work of the gospel in a person's soul, or the spread of the gospel in the, in the world at large, which is the next parable on from this one. And it's, I want to just remind us that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, uh, and we come to those words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, we are actually praying about the salvation of souls and the, the growth of the gospel in the world in which we live. So before we come to actually looking at this parable, uh, do we, I want to ask this question, do we pray for souls? Uh, do we pray for people who we know are not yet believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? And do we pray for the, the spread of the gospel into the world in which we live? And it's good to be reminded, I think sometimes, that we should be doing that. And that's something that Jesus told us that we should do. And it says, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 28 and verse 18 to 20, these last words before he was to be uh, taken up into glory, he says to his disciples these instructions, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Well, having said all that, let's go to this parable, uh, verses 26 to 29. The first thing I want to say, uh, uh, or the first point really, is this. The gospel seed is scattered on the ground and it needs to be prepared. In a previous parable, which we saw some weeks ago, we, we had the parable of the soils, didn't we? And there were certain soils. There was uh, that rocky soil. There was that uh, soil of thorns and weeds. There was that hard soil. But there was one soil that was the good soil, wasn't it? And it's the... It's the good soil that we're talking about here. The ground to receive the gospel uh, need, the uh, seeds need to be prepared. So the preparation of, of the ground is the work that the Holy Spirit does in a person's soul. But how does he do it? Well, he does so in many and in various ways. First of all, perhaps he might do so by means of some sorrow or some great disappointment that might be in somebody's life. Uh, telling them, if you like, that life is not so wonderful. You know, we're often told on the, uh, in adverts and on the television uh, that uh, life, is, life is amazing and if you buy all these different products, it'll be even great, greater. But life's not like that and sometimes life can be very sorrowful and lots and lots of problems and difficulties. And sometimes God will use those sorrows, those troubles and those trials to say, say to the soul, life isn't so good, but there is a better life. And it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or he might bring someone to so low uh, that uh, they, they've lost any confidence, any trust in themselves or in anybody else. And that their only hope becomes believing in God, and through believing in God, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Others, it might be the realization that God really does exist. Because the world in which we live, this nation of ours especially, it seems to me that quite a lot of folk these days don't really believe that God is. And they keep getting told that, don't they, on all kinds of different television programs. But then sometimes God breaks into someone's life 
and shows that he really is there. He is the true God. Another is an awareness of sin in one's life. That you're not as nice or as good as you thought you were. And you come to that realization that you're not good enough to go to heaven. Now practically, by, by way of personal testimony, not all of those things, but quite a few of those things, were steps to my own uh, uh, coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The disappointment of, of life, the, the reality that God exists, the awareness of sin uh, in my life, and knowing that I'm not good enough to go to heaven. And all those things that the, God the Holy Spirit uses as steps to bring people to believe and to love in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me bring you to a, a second point. A man scatters seed on the ground. And that's, uh, I want to read verse 26. There, whoops. I'm having a few problems here, John. There we are. So there, verse 26. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Now, God uses means by which the gospel seed is to be sown into the good soil. And the usual way in which the gospel seed is sown into a man's heart is by communicating the gospel of uh, the, the communication of the gospel in truth. Uh, sometimes it's the word of God preached, isn't it? Uh, you hear a sermon, a preacher preaches. And the, the, the gospel truth is given out and it's taken into the heart. God the Holy Spirit is the one who plants that seed. It may be the word of God that is, that is read. And sometimes you read the scriptures and the word of God uh, speaks into the soul the gospel truth. It can be by a means of personal testimony when you've met somebody who is a Christian and they want to tell you of how they came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and that sharing of uh, the gospel is another way in which the gospel seed is taken into the soul. Sometimes, of course, it's by other means. It could be a, a book that has been read. It could be a CD of a sermon that was heard, perhaps. It could be a tract, a little leaflet. It could be a video. Uh, God uses various means. And uh, though I, as a preacher, I, I like to think of it, the usual means being the sermon and the preaching of God's word. But all those things are preparing the soil, for the, for the, making it a good soil. So that as the man scatters the seed, the seed falls onto the ground and it, it begins to germinate. I found this interesting quote from J.C. Ryle on this point. He says, uh, it is unnatural for soil to grow wheat by itself. It needs to be prepared because otherwise it can only grow weeds. And uh, that's, a, that's a gospel truth. That's a spiritual truth, isn't it? Uh, God prepares us to receive uh, that gospel seed. But one thing we should say is this, that once the gospel seed has been sown, once you've uh, uh, perhaps uh, you shared with somebody something of the gospel, well, we can do no more than that, can we? Uh, God the Holy Spirit has to do the work. He is the one who takes the gospel seed and puts it into a person's soul and causes it to germinate. All that we can do is to, to pray and to wait. And uh, in verse 27, we read these words. Uh, he's talking about the farmer or the sower of the seed. Uh, and, and he says, verse 27, I should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. And that's true, isn't it? That's what a farmer, that's the farmer's experience. Okay, he might be able to talk about the biochemistry or the, the, the botany of it all, but really the reality is the seed is sown, it goes into the ground, and it grows. And the farmer doesn't, 
that doesn't do anything, uh, have anything to do about that. <laughs> he just sleeps and he waits, doesn't he? Well, that brings me on to the third one. The work of the spirit in the soul. Well, just as this seems uh, something of a mystery, and we've been talking a little bit of the, about this mystery, of how a seed is planted into the soil, and the seed grows. And uh, if you were to look down to the, uh, the, uh, the other parable that comes on after, and we're going to look at that next time, we, we discover that that little seed can become a huge tree, which even the, the birds of the air can, can rest in. But the mystery is how it all happens, isn't it? And so it is with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy, Holy Spirit, uh, when the gospel seed has been given, mysteriously is at work in the soul of a man or a woman, opening the heart to the truth of, of the gospel. And a man, or a woman for that matter, can seem so dead to spiritual things, the heart can seem to be so hardened, uh, and you might say to yourself, well, how can such a, a soul live? How can such a, a hard heart become soft to the things of the gospel? And that becomes the greatest of all miracles, doesn't it? That the dead are alive. Spiritual life comes into the soul and it becomes alive in Christ. Now, Paul had something to say about this. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, and we're going to read verse 4 and 5 as well. Ephesians 2 verse 1, and you he made alive. He's writing to Christians, the church at Ephesus, and he says, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sins. When he came to Ephesus, the people looked all dead. There was no spiritual life. But he preached the gospel. What happened? The gospel seed was sown onto the ground, and God the Holy Spirit caused it to live. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's, how, that's, that's what they were, dead, he says. And then verse 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then he adds, by grace, you have been saved. That's a reminder to us. This is all of God's doing. You know, we're just the instruments. If we know and love the Lord Jesus Christ and we share the gospel or we speak about the Lord Jesus Christ, we're just the instruments. It's God, the Holy Spirit, that takes over the gospel seed and gives life. Well, let me take you to our fourth point. The stages of godly growth in the soul. Stages of godly growth in the soul. And we need to go to Mark uh, chapter 4, verse 28. Let me read these words to you. Uh, For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. And then we'll read the next verse. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. So, what are the four, what are the stages of godly growth in the soul? Well, the first is the blade. That's what it says in verse 28. Uh, for the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade. Now, the blade, as, he's, uh, as the Bible is saying, telling here, is the first sign of life, uh, of the seed actually germinated and penetrating the soil the first sight that you know that what you've planted is actually growing. I wonder how often and how long a farmer has to go uh, and keep looking at his uh, field that he has sown his, his wheat seed on before there's any sign of life. Perhaps if he's a, a Christian man, he might have prayed to God concerning it, the harvest, concerning the seed that was sown. And then he sees it, doesn't he? One day he goes down to this field. It seemed barren. It seemed as if it was just empty. And then one day he goes out to that field and he can see the little green shoots sticking up. He knows that the seed was good seed and it's in a good ground and it's going to have a good harvest. He sees, if you like, if we can put it back again uh, in, a, in that Christian 
context. It, the spiritual life has suddenly appeared. The gospel seed was sown. People had witnessed. People had testified. Somebody perhaps had heard a sermon. Nothing seemed to be happening. And then suddenly, there's that spiritual life that, that you can see. I well remember a time at university. Uh, there was a particular man who was uh, giving the, the Christians in the university a really hard time. He was full of all these difficult questions. There was always some argument that he was putting forward to some of the Christians uh, uh, about why they should, uh, the gospel was wrong and why there was no God and all this sort of stuff. And I can remember a number of the Christians were getting really fed up with this particular guy. He seemed to be determined to have an a, a attack uh, the believers, uh, the Christians in the university. And then the summer holidays came. It was the end of the summer term. Uh, the summer holidays came. And then in the autumn, this man came back. And it was discovered that he had become a new creature in Christ Jesus. God had been working on him. He'd been listening. Although he was giving his arguments, although he was, as it were, resisting what, what, he, was, what he was listening to, God, the Holy Spirit, had planted that good seed in his soul. And when he came back in the autumn term, you could see the green shoots. You could see that he had been, a, he'd been changed. He'd become a Christian, and he was growing uh, as a believer. That new shoot was sprouting up. That's the blade. But then we have, uh, in that verse, verse 28, the head. And so we have uh, uh, the blade... And then, uh, then the head, we're told. You see the green shoots in the field uh, that was sown of gospel seed. But how do you know that that, that site that you're seeing is really a, a, a true gospel plant? Uh, that, that, the, that the person who now says that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is a true uh, Christian. How do you know that the seed that was sown uh, and it is actually the proper seed and not weeds springing up in their place? Jesus told us, didn't he, another parable. We won't go to this one yet, but uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares. You know, the enemy that came into the field and sowed tares and so that the wheat and the tares grew up. How do you know the difference between a wheat and a tare when you've just seen the green shoot popping up on the ground? Well, the answer is this. You must wait and see what happens. Uh, you have to wait and see how the plant grows. And you will recognize the plant by its, by its roots. By, not by its roots, by its leaves. By, by its flower head, perhaps, that develops. Uh, when we, uh, uh, in the spring, uh, when we had moved into our house, uh, Jane and I discovered a plant uh, that suddenly seemed to uh, appear from nowhere. Uh, and uh, we didn't know what it was. It, 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 it just that it didn't quite look like, like the weeds that were all around the plant. And we thought perhaps it must be, perhaps it's a, a proper plant, proper garden plant. So what we decided to do was to, to leave it there and to continue to make it grow uh, rather than dig it out and just assume it's a weed. Now, I had a pretty good idea of what I thought it was, and Jane had a different idea of what it was, and I think in the end, it turned out it was completely different, but it was a proper garden plant. And uh, we looked after it, and uh, it's still flowering now. It's a, it's a cornflower, if anybody's interested, and it's still flowering, uh, and it was just as well. It wasn't a weed, it was a proper plant. And so that's a, perhaps a lesson to us, that we need to continue to wait and see uh, in the process of time, all who truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, all who are truly theirs, are truly belonging to Jesus, uh, we will discover by their fruit that they really are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will know that they are uh, a child of God, and time will tell. Well, we can go on to the next stage in verse 28, which is that of the, the full-grown head. Another thing that we've got to wait for is this, and that's the, the fruit of the plant 
to develop. You know, you can have a plant and it has its nice bushy leaves and you can say, oh yes, that's, that's that particular plant. That's the chrysanthemum plant I planted or something like that. But you have to wait for the flowers, don't you? And you have to wait uh, for that, at that time when it's got to its maturity. And this is what the parable is talking about here. And in verse 29, we read, but when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Our trouble, of course, is that we're naturally impatient. And sometimes we can harvest at the wrong time. Uh, this summer, we've got a, a little uh, bed of strawberries, and uh, the strawberries were looking really well. And there was one big strawberry that was very red, and I just couldn't wait to take that strawberry and to eat it. But what I didn't realize was, on the other side, after I cut the strawberry off, it was still green. It wasn't ripe, and uh, it didn't taste that good. <laughs> uh, so I learned to be patient. You know, I have to be patient. It may have looked ripe, but it wasn't quite ripe. Uh, and uh, that's the true of the farmer, isn't it? Uh, he can't have his uh, field of wheat, and he's beginning to see the head of grain uh, developing. Well, he's got to wait for it to be mature, so that the, the head swells, the head of grain swells, and it becomes as mature as possible. And then he can come in. Uh, with uh, the sickle, as we're told here, and harvest. Well, what is this full grain of head that uh, is here in the parable? Well, I think I, I believe that it's uh, what the Lord has in mind is the calling or the, uh, we might describe it like this, the promotion of the believer to glory and to heaven itself, to enter into the Father's rest. You know, a plant... And if we think of it in terms of Christians, uh, the plant in the field can have a hard time of it, can't it? Uh, the plants today in the garden are having a hard time of it, aren't they? It's pouring down with rain. They're probably getting flooded out. I know some of my pots are. I had to empty the water out this morning. Uh, there are dangers for the plants of heat and of cold, perhaps, of flood and wind. But the grain is safe when it's been harvested in, isn't it? And now we can apply that to a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's tough at times to be a Christian. There are hard times for the believer. But we're always safe in Jesus, aren't we? That's the certainty of the scriptures. That if we, be if we belong to Jesus, we've given our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are Christians, then we are safe in Jesus. But once we're gathered into heaven, we're eternally saved, aren't we? That's the point. And as we come to a, a close, I picked up this uh, comment from uh, Johnny Erickson Tada. Uh, I'll explain a little bit who she is in a moment, but it was from her Facebook. She's got a Facebook page called uh, Johnny and Friends. And in this uh, Facebook uh, page, uh, Johnny and, and Friends, she wrote this comment. Now, Johnny, uh, as a young, well, I, 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 always, I still seem to think of her as a sort of 20-year-old. Uh, not so young, uh, Johnny, now. Um, she uh, was involved in a, a tr an accident uh, that caused her to be paralyzed. It was a diving accident, and she was paralyzed. And uh, she could, uh, from, the, from the neck down, I think, isn't it? And... Uh, and I remember reading the, the book, uh, her book that she wrote, about how she was so angry with God. She was a Christian, but she got so angry with God that God had allowed this to happen to her. Well, that was the first few months where she's in hospital. But God had been dealing with her, and God had been speaking to her. And she's become a very remarkable Christian now. And <laughs> she, she actually uh, speaks at conferences and it goes around the world in her wheelchair, and they put her in co at various conferences to speak about the Christian and suffering. In 200, uh, 210, 2010, she was diagnosed with cancer, and she wrote on her Facebook again about how, God, how could God do this to me after all the suffering I've been through, but God spoke to her, God dealt with her, and she came to the grasp uh, you know, that there was a purpose behind it, and she had an operation, cancer was believed to be removed. Well, the, the Facebook uh, 
writing that I read was this, that uh, in 2018, uh, the cancer had come back. And uh, again, uh, she responded, but she responded in a much better way. This is, this is what she wrote on her Facebook when the doctor told her that the cancer had come back. When I received the unexpected news, I relaxed and smiled, knowing that my sovereign God loves me, loves me dearly, and holds me tightly in his hands. What good is it if we only trust the Lord when we understand his ways? That only guarantees a life filled with doubts. And then she added, Jesus is ecstasy beyond compare. And if new hardships draw us closer to him, I'm more than content with it. Well, as far as I know, because I know she was doing, a, 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 doing some sort of, uh, sort of virtual conference uh, in Newport in South Wales uh, last week. As far as I know, she's still alive and kicking. Well, not kicking, but still alive. Let's put it that way. Uh, so God hasn't yet called her to heaven. But one of the things that comes over to me was this, that as she's maturing, as she's becoming that full head, as it were from the parable, she's ready. She's ready to be with Jesus. And perhaps we might even say she's longing to be with Jesus. Are we, are we in that stage ourselves, ready, prepared to be with our Jesus in glory? Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we come before you. We Ask and pray that your good hand will be upon us as we've thought of this particular parable. Uh, we pray, Father, that it might be true of us that we are that uh, uh, seed that uh, has been sown onto good soil and it has produced uh, the shoot and, Lord, the beginnings of the head and perhaps the, even, Lord, uh, uh, beginning to be the full head of grain. And we praise you and thank you that as we look back and as we think about these things we want to thank you that for the gospel uh, for the gospel that tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way uh, to, to you and uh, the only way to eternal life but what we want to praise you and thank you for especially this morning Lord is for that work of the Holy Spirit that mysterious work of the Holy Spirit who comes and places the gospel seed into our souls and causes it to grow and, and to mature. And Lord, that's a reminder to us that, first of all, Father, that it's all of Jesus. It's all of you, our salvation. And that also, Lord, that we can be reminded that we're just simply instruments. We're there to sow some gospel seed and scatter it on the ground and that Lord you do that work of bringing souls to faith in Christ and so we pray Lord uh, perhaps there are people in our own minds in our own hearts who we know do not yet love you and we pray for them Lord pray that the gospel seed will be sown into their hearts and it will it will start growing and come to a Come to fruition, we pray. We pray all this now in the precious name of Jesus. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.